Hello, and welcome to another edition of Coffee with Comrades, a podcast discussing current events, theory, and action through a radical lens. So, here's the thing. I know pretty much every week I hop on the mic at the top of an episode and talk about how great it is and how awesome this week's discussion is, and in many ways that's always true. I I fucking love doing this podcast because it affords me such ample opportunities to chat with genuinely awesome folks. But rest assured, this is probably one of my top five favorite episodes of Coffee with Comrades we've ever done. And it has everything to do with our lovely guest this week, Carla Bergman, author of Joyful Militancy and one of the hosts of Grounded Futures and Silver Threads. Militant Joy has been one of the cornerstones of this podcast since its inception. A great deal of that is due to the work of Carla and Nick and their book, Joyful Militancy, which I cannot recommend enough. But another huge aspect of this show's sort of ideological and philosophical base is the dispossessed. And in this interview, we talk a lot about both those books and sort of compare and contrast them and read Joyful Militancy as an analog of the dispossessed. We tackle the subject of rigid radicalism, explore educational approaches, and generally nerd out. If there was an episode of Coffee with Comrades that I would recommend to a first-time listener of this show, in all likelihood, it would probably be this one. But I digress. Before we get to today's discussion, check out this jingle from some of our pals on the Channel Zero Network. Hello, and welcome to We Will Remember Freedom, a monthly podcast of anarchist fiction. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. Hello, and welcome to Live Like the World is Dying, your podcast for what feels like the end times. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. Hello, and welcome to The Jingle for both of my podcasts. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. You can find my podcasts wherever you get your podcasts or get them from the Channel Zero Network. As always, Coffee with Comrades is a proud part of the CZN and the Rev Left Radio Federation of Podcasts. If you dig this program, please consider signing up to support our work by going to www.patreon.com forward slash coffee with comrades. This DIY independent media project survives and thrives due to the generosity, solidarity, and affinity of the program's many patrons. If you enjoy Coffee with Comrades, we'd be absolutely honored to have your support. But hey, this is a podcast by working people for working people. So if money's tight for you right now, we totally get it. You can still support our program by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or by following us on Twitter and Instagram, retweeting and sharing new episodes, and sharing this podcast with your friends. Since we don't pay to advertise this show or accept ads from corporate sponsors, word of mouth is virtually the only way new folks learn about the program, and that is all thanks to you. All right, enough already. I'll get out of your hair. I sincerely hope that you enjoy episode 117 of Coffee with Comrades, Militant Joy, a conversation with Carla Burton.
Well, today I am joined by Carla Bergman, author of Joyful Militancy, one of the hosts of Grounded Futures and Silver Threads, and all-around badass. Welcome on Coffee with Comrades, Carla. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm, I'm excited to have you. It's going to be a fun conversation. You know, I, I've been a, a follower of your work for some time now, and um, I'm really excited that we could, like, actually convene. It's funny, like, I, I, I didn't know that you were on Twitter. I, I, I should have, like, guessed, like, like virtually everyone's on Twitter these days. But I didn't realize until uh, you had made, like, a post about right. the dispossessed. And then, and then like, I made the, the connection. I was like, oh, oh, my God, this is Carla. I should reach out and see if, if she wants to come on Coffee with Comrades. So um, it works out. Yeah, see, Ursula, always just always there for us. Indeed, the, the great uniter. The great what would uniter. we do without her? Um, well, thanks for having me. I love the name of your show. I'm really jealous. I um, I love naming things. And like if we lived in a uh -huh. non-capitalistic uh, state society, that would probably be what I do. Like I'd be that person to be like, <laughs> can be I like of things? And you know, we'd, we'd have to have consensus and whatnot, <laughs> but I would just, I love naming things and it's such a good name. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I, I, I actually can't take credit for it. Um, one of my good friends and comrades who I uh, co-founded the show with, uh, it was it was all her idea. Um, uh, I've told the story many times, but um, I'll tell you again, just because it's funny. Uh, you know, we were like, hanging out one day and having coffee, and she like looks up at me and she's like, "Pearson, we should start a podcast." And I was like, uh, "Okay," <laughs> like you know, like yeah. how so many humans yeah. do these days. Yeah. Like we should start a podcast, and I was like, "Okay, sure." And she's like, I call coffee with comrades. <laughs> so good. <laughs> like, that's perfect. That's exactly yeah, yeah. what we're doing. So, oh, man. Um, well, listen, I, you know, Carla, one of the things that I, has always fascinated me, and, and I try to ask pretty much every guest that I, that I have on the show, I, I'm just always, like, endlessly fascinated about how folks actually get involved in radical politics. And, and I was wondering if you could tell me a bit about that process and what it looked like for you. Like, how did you get interested in anarchism and, and doing mutual aid work? Well, <laughs> I'm in my 50s, so I'm trying to like get the um, the Coles notes. <laughs> I mean, the first my first response is that I was I, I always had an activist, like an act out spirit, right? Like I was that mm -hmm. kid. I was the youngest of a large family. I had older brothers who were who fought all the time. And I was just I had that fearlessness of getting in between them to stop the fighting, to stop the harm. To, you know, so I I think like I need to just point back to just that moment but um there's kind of a few watershed moments like in the early 80s I was really in the punk scene um I like to call it my uh, sex pistol anarchist days <laughs> so it was like less <laughs> focused it was kind of all over the place <laughs> anarchy I don't know I didn't know what I was talking about um and my sister who's um 11 years older than me um probably like 79 or 80 like I think we did a, a march because of the, what happened with the Santanistas um mm -hmm. You know, I would pop in and out of that, those kind of things with her. Um, lots around nuclear, <laughs> like this was like the Reagan era, right? So um, lots about that. Dead Kennedy songs really influenced my thinking. <laughs> Did you see the the tragedy that is yeah. the, the Dead Kennedys like supporting fucking Mitt Romney? Like what a what a it's disaster. such a disaster. <laughs> it's so frustrating. I mean, and then this is why I kind of left that scene. I I, I actually watched it. Um, the skinheads and the punks in the early eighties kind of merge, not everybody. Right. But I was like, I'm out. <laughs> like I even had a venue space and um, I just had to cancel and leave. Um, and I kind of like uh, ducked out for quite a while, um, was dealing with some personal trauma and healing and really the, there's two things in there in the same year. One is the Zapatistas mm -hmm. um, and one is ha having a kid. Um, so 1994. And it just <sighs> ruptured me. And, and there's two things there. One thing is like, and it's like, it's my obsession and what I probably tweet the most about and what I write about the most is how can we even think about changing our world when we, when we oppress children so much? Um, yeah. And I, and I constantly am unsatisfied with the response <laughs> to that, to that question. And I every time I, I'm on Instagram and I see somebody's made a new Venn, what are those things? Venn diagrams um, of the, you know, the intersections of oppressions and the children are never on it. <laughs> 
And right. when they are, it's usually somebody who's do been doing the work I've done for a long time. And it's, we're talking to each other. And we're like, high five. <laughs> right? <laughs> <Fist bump. laughs> yeah, kids, autonomy forever. <laughs> so that's been the kind of main thread that got me involved. It was the work I did um, through uh, working at the Purple Thistle Center, which was a youth-run arts and activism space that was funded by Matt Hearn and um, a bunch of youth in 2001. Um, Today on Murray Bookchin's uh, birthday, it's important for me to mention that he was also really influential. I identified as a sociocologist for, you know, most of the 90s, um, early into the 2000s. If you don't mind me asking, uh, is there a reason why you stopped or is it just that, like, is it is that so informative and <laughs> I mean, part of it? Is this is this the drama? Is this the tea? <laughs> are we about to, are we mean, about to spill the tea, Carla? <laughs> yeah, we're going to spill it. Um, no, I think what it is is that I'm always, you know, like Nietzsche, you know, that idea of like you're always becoming, you're never, you're not always, you're not this set of solid being who doesn't change and shift. And um, I, don't, I wouldn't say I've moved beyond Bookchin's ideas. Like, I, I mean, it's so exciting to see them take hold. There's some core stuff that I still hold. You know, humans are part of the ecology. We're all, it's all connected. That was, those are radical ideas. Even in like, um, when I was in philosophy classes in, um, in like 2000, like I got in trouble for saying that, <laughs> right? That humans exist in nature. Right. Why are we separating them? I probably got in trouble because I quoted Bruno Latour or somebody rather than I like a, <laughs> a rationalist, right? Like, I think that's what actually right. got me in trouble is I was really into Donna Haraway and did that instead. Shout out to Donna Haraway. I fucking love Donna Haraway, like so much. Yeah, she's really, really important. And I forget to mention her when people say who influenced me and my son, who's now 26, always goes... Dude, Donna, <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> so I, I guess like, you know, on a philosophical way, on a theoretical way, like I, the thing that's that, and you don't see Bookchin in our book, um, and that has a lot to do with Nick, um, and he should probably speak to that more than me, but I think it's, it's both of our penchant away from rationalists, right? I think mm -hmm. that's how I would say I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not that's super fair. schooled. Right. Like I dropped out of every institution I went to, I, you know, so I, I sometimes um, make up things <laughs> and get in trouble. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I definitely think there's that like rationalist trend mm -hmm. uh, all throughout Bookchin's work and his sort mm -hmm. of veneration of um, like almost like Greco Roman logic. Yes. Um, I definitely think that suffuses, uh, his work for, for better or for worse. Um, and, and it's funny, I, I, I know that you're a big proponent of, uh, of unschooling. Yes. And I know this is getting, this is getting so, we're, we're already off script, but like, <laughs> yeah. that always makes for the best conversations. I have to say just real quick, thank you so much for your notes, but I didn't read them. I used to, but I, um, I, I've leaned into my, or I've embraced my um, neural difference, which is actually, if I read them ahead of time, I will obsess for days and not think of anything oh, no. else. And then I don't totally. show up as myself, right? Like I get all scripted. Right. So, but I do appreciate it, but I didn't look at them. So let's go off script. Yeah, let's go off script. Well, yeah, <laughs> fuck it. No, no, I, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I like sending them out just because yeah. like that way people have an option, you know, yeah, like I know a lot of people get really paralyzed if they don't have yeah. the questions ahead of time and that can cause a lot of anxiety. So yeah. I try and do it either way. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, for sure. But anyway, so, so unschooling. So, so, um, you know, I've, I've worked, uh, for the better part now of six years teaching at various like colleges, um, and universities across the state of Florida. But like now I'm in this really interesting situation where I am helping my partner homeschool, um, just because of the pandemic and everything yeah. like that. And, and it's really exciting and not something that I anticipated getting thrust into. And I, and I don't know a lot about unschooling, but like one of the things that has kind of like not plagued, but, but been, been difficult for me, especially as someone who's really interested in like liberatory and emancipatory and, and even anarchic, like explicitly anarchic forms of pedagogy is like, okay, it's, it's really easy to give students, um, who are interested in literature and interested in finding out more about, um, culture and media, uh, a lot of autonomy and space mm -hmm. and, and room mm -hmm. to explore and then taking those that, that that freedom in that liberatory space and reducing it to things that that um 
the kids are maybe not super excited <laughs> about learning about it becomes becomes a lot mm-hmm. harder and so you know um I'm sure we could talk about this for for, for <laughs> hours, but like it's been so um, interesting trying to um, be authentic mm-hmm. with with the the, the approach mm-hmm. um, pedagogically mm-hmm. um, and translating it and treating them, continuing to treat them both like equals and like um, active participants in the um, process of of collaborative knowledge making mm-hmm. rather than them being passive receptacles of it um, through you know, reading literature or in, interacting with science experiments, like trying to bring them up in a way that allows them to engage meaningfully mm-hmm. with it. But it's, it's, it can be really challenging mm-hmm. because there are times where they just dig their heels in and they do not <laughs> totally. like do a thing. Right. So you're um, talking about like curriculum, curriculum based stuff that they kind of have to do and you're like helping to facilitate that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And, and I know like, you know, you, uh, for, well, I guess we should maybe take a step back because you know, folks listening to this might might hear the term unschooling yeah. and be like, unschooling. What the fuck right. is that? So, so could you, as someone who is a proponent of this kind of approach, can can you maybe um, give us like a Reader's Digest sure. version of like what that what that what that means? First, I'll just give a quick shout out to Soulcast because he does have an episode with me and my son about this exactly <clears throat> about autonomy begins at home and and about his unschool my son's nerdy unschooling years so i just want to put that out because then it's like an hour and a half and it's really in depth and it's fucking great uh, i i've listened to it i should uh say <laughs> that we'll link to it in the show notes because it's very good so you should check that out too yeah i think that that will just help but yeah to me like you know there's all kinds of different definitions um but my i always go back to john holt who coined it in the 70s and the idea is that you know um the other way of talking about it is learning without school or we're always learning. Like humans are always learning. Um, it's interesting. We, we will say that animals do that, but we, we don't say that about ourselves. Um, so the idea is that you don't actually need to be uh, encouraged and taught to, to learn something. Um, and so there's a, where it connect, where it connects with maybe liberatory or autonomous thinking is that um, allowing people to find what they're interested in and what they're passionate about um you know there's a joke about um unschoolers will uh (laughs) when they're into something they know everything about it because they do a deep dive because they're not in the constraints of a curriculum right and I think any nerdy person has that and one of the things that I tried to do through the purple thistle and I think this was Matt's thing too is it was open after school hours was to try to get out of the binary of school and unschool or school and de school, um, and just provide a um, liberatory learning space where uh, young people could decide where they, you know, where they can come in and decide what they're passionate about. And then we would help them find mentors and people to um, work with and train from. And, um, and I think it's like, it's that just disrupting that conflation with that learning and schooling somehow have to go together. And, um, I mean, I go so far to say that I'm anti-pedagogy because I think, and it, it's, I'm talking more along the lines of our social relations and how we build a society together. I'm anti-pedagogy because I think that when you come in with a top-down didactic system of how to do things, like people are frustrated that joyful militancy doesn't have the 10 ways to deal with rigid radicalism. It just is, <laughs> as you know, it does not do that at all. Because the minute you pin right. it down once and for all, you actually become the thing that you just said you were trying not to do. Because you're not working with the people in the room. You're not working with the relationships. You're not working with what the needs are. And you just, I think I've got off track here, but basically <laughs> um, what I, at the end of the day, and this was so helpful for my own learning around um, my my self-worth and my failures of dropping out of high school and dropping out of here and dropping out of college, dropping out of university, um, was that unschooling can happen in school or out of school. It's actually an approach to learning. So it's in a holistic, passionate approach to learning. Uh, that's all it is, <laughs> right? So you can do that. Yeah. In, and that changed my life immensely and I watched it change a lot of schooled kids lives that I, that were part of the purple thistle because you know a lot of kids don't have access to not go to school they actually need to get away from their parents because it's right home. yeah uh, mm-hmm. they can't imagine 
they don't have someone who can help facilitate them through the systems. Like my son has a MA as an MA now from in uh, composition um, without any school. Um, and my youngest is more like, I want my grade 12. So he just, he does self-directed learning. And, and that, that comes back to what you were saying. And so sometimes he has to jump through the hoops. And my advice to you and what we've always said is to just not make it something it's not. So this is a game. This is what institutions do. They give you, they have to do a curriculum. They have to, they're teaching you how to figure out how to like make an argument or whatever class it is, right? How to do a science experiment. This is, this is all an agenda, right? And you're part of it. <laughs> like the list of things that you need to, tasks that you need to complete and demonstrate mastery right. on in order to uh, achieve some right. form of uh, archaic grade. And like system. nine-year-olds instinctively get that when you tell them that. Like they just are like, cool, right? Like you're going to have like these hoops throughout your life that you're going to have to jump through. And this, you're going to learn how to do that. This, you're going to actually get gain those skills if you can just do this assignment, like that one skill or whatever. And that's kind of, um, yeah, we've just always approached it as an, you know, we call it odd schooling. Like um, if you want to go to the school, go to school. If you don't want to go to school, don't go to school. It's all a myth that says you have to. It's not, it's, right. it's nonlinear. <laughs> right? Yeah, totally. No. And, and it's really interesting thinking too about it being like making it into a game for them of like, Hey, like, Unfortunately, we live in this like, uh, you know, repressive and oppressive society that oftentimes makes you jump through hoops. And this is one of the, and this is a skill that you can, that you can develop and, and putting it into that language, I think might be helpful. So that's really, that's really, yeah. um, and just really helpful. I appreciate and it. listening and being curious. Like I knew my son, my son went to regular school for uh, my oldest, um, for kindergarten, grade one and grade two. Um, and he was always, he was such a nerd and he would be frustrated and he'd be like, <laughs> the ear has more than four parts and he'd get in trouble all the time. Right. Cause he'd be like, uh, excuse me. He's very neuro different. Um, I read a biology book at home and I'm pretty sure <laughs> like, and the teacher would just be like rage. Right. Right. And this is where we would have that articulation about, they're not actually interested in you learning about the ear in grade one. Right. They're trying to teach yeah. you methodology to prepare you for mm -hmm. when you learn about the year. <laughs> right? right. And he was like, right. that's really wrong. <laughs> Cause he's that type of learner. He needs, I'm right. that type of learner too. I need the whole picture. And what's that called? Inductive, deductive, whatever. He like, he's that kind of learner. And so school does not work for that kind of learner. It just, right. you're just going to get constantly bump up against like, I don't understand. You're starting with the, some in tiny details and I don't get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Uh and and it's it's it, you're absolutely right. You're not teaching them. I I I think putting that in that precise terms, right? You're not teaching them about the ear. You're teaching them a specific method yeah. of learning about the right. ear, which is, is is so really in in so many ways is really unhelpful. Um and doesn't actually cultivate a, a sense of curiosity mm -hmm. or a, a sense of learning. Totally. But yeah, that's that's fascinating and and, and I really appreciate it. And God, I know that I could probably bounce ideas about <laughs> unschooling off of you for an, an era because it's something that just like on the like from a philosophical perspective just really interests me. Um, but I, I also wanted to ask you, Carla, just because it does seem to be a theme that kind of suffuses your work and your and your personality. But I'm, I'm curious, you, you know, you, you throw this term joy around <laughs> quite a lot. And, and, I, and I'm curious, like why that term speaks right. to you. Thanks. That's a, that's a fun question. It probably goes way back, but my sister always saying, this is a shout out to a Canadian musician called Bruce Coburn. I don't know if people know him, but he had a song called joy will find a way. And she'd sing it all the time that, you know, joy will find a way. I'm not going to sing it. No one wants me to sing, <laughs> <laughs> um, but Google it. As longing becomes love, as night turns to day.
you know, I had that song constantly buzzing around. I think it's really important. I say that up front, but I can actually just pinpoint it. So in 2001, before 9-11, um, I was studying Spinoza. Um, and I, you know, it was Western philosophy class and we had to write a worldview based off of just, you know, that era. What is that? Like 15, 16, 1700. So really narrow bunch of philosophers. So Spinoza is really the only potentially radical one in that group. So we had to pick one right. and w- wrap our worldview around. And this is where I got in trouble when I, I think I quoted Bruno Latour or Donna Haraway or something and <laughs> conflated, you know, you're not allowed to put Spinoza in conversation with them unless you're Deleuze, right? <laughs> like, like, right? Um, so I, anyways, I, at the same time, I was reading The Dispossessed and Ursula in that book, even though it's not about joyful militancy per se. Oh, it definitely is. It wanted, I agree. I disagree. I think it wanted to present. Okay. I do is. too, but I'm getting like a bunch of slapbacks about it. Um, <laughs> I, uh, heard there's so many quotes. I, I can't pull them out of my head right now, but, um, basically like you got to struggle joy is about struggle um you Mm -hmm. if you like avoid all hard stuff and all potential struggles you might have moments of pleasure you might have moments of happiness but joy you will never experience true joy joy comes from um the struggle so i was doing so i was doing both at the same time and i had a really uh personal had three intersecting personal things happen that were like you know were really, really hard. Um, and I, I had said to my partner, I'm like, I still have this belly full of joy though. Like, what is that? Like, I, you know, I just feel, um, and it's really connected to militancy. And so I, I really want to name the book Militant Joy, which shout out to the French who just did a translation because they read the book and they're like, it's called, it's Militant Joy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a good reason why it's not called that in America. I think in the U.S., I think it would have gotten um, swept up in kind of self-help thinking. I think it would have got joy is just. I think joy was on the top front page of the Time magazine over Christmas. Like, you know, oh, claiming really joy. It's like boo. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's in- it's interesting too from from sort of a semantic. And this yeah. is again derailing, but it, you know, we'll, we're we're getting in the reads here. It, from a semantic perspective, it's really interesting because what is the what is the modifier and what is the the actual word that we're focusing totally. on right like are we focusing on militancy yeah. right or are we focusing on joy right and so i've always sort of at you know especially after reading i shouldn't say always but definitely after reading the book and and being immersed in the dispossessed and and you know doing you know this sort of work <laughs> for over a decade now like I, I i i constantly find myself coming back to wanting to emphasize and re-emphasize the joy part rather than the militancy part i think i think it's an essential dialectic Mm -hmm. but i but personally to me the joy is the thing that that um ought to be foregrounded ought to be modified ought to be enhanced and infused throughout the work that we're we're trying to do yeah here here (laughs) Thanks for getting it that way. It's not always the case. Like I always had a saying that uh, joy has sharp edges and people are like, I don't get it. (laughs) I think the first piece we put out um, before the book came out was happiness is bullshit. And then we break down the difference between happiness. I mean, my goal is always for people to not conflate those two, but it's so deeply done. Like it's so hard to pull it apart. Oh, for sure. I mean, I've often argued with friends that there are like distinct differences (laughs) between joy and happiness, right? Like, you know, joy is something that we share with others. Mm -hmm. It's something that comes from our interpersonal relationships in our community. And I I think also, and you've kind of been hinting at this like already in this conversation, but I think it's also really crucial to reiterate that joy is something that happens in spite of suffering. It's not an absence of suffering, but a feeling of you know, y- y- euphoria and sheer and and bliss and solidarity that happens in defiance totally, of suffering. Yeah. And I think that that's why it's such a more powerful term other than happiness, because happiness is like a- almost an entirely individual despair oh. or affair. It's like, this is what I- I'm happy because I got a raise or I'm happy because I received this gift, mm-hmm. right? It's not this um, thing that you share. It's not this thing that brings you into relationship with mm-hmm. other uh, uh, other living beings, rather, it's just something that is 
hoarded almost jealously for the self. And I think that that those are two very distinct t- terms mm-hmm. um, that like we would do well to to disentangle. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and I think militant. Like it's funny because we we had passed a around not using militancy. Um, but I, I, I was always really attached to it because I think it's like, I am militant about joy. Like I am (laughs) like, because joy, because, and it comes back a little, like just to go down the nerd verse a bit, it does come back to what Spinoza was getting at, right? Like that joy, joy, uh, increases our ability to act and respond. Um, it, it increases our personal and collective power right? Versus what he had the dichotomy between joy and sadness. We got, we dropped the sadness because when we interviewed people talk about a word that gets, uh, loses, um, philosophical meaning, right? Pretty fast. Yeah. People were like, are you telling me I can't have, I can't have grief. I'm like, no, 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 no. Very different. (laughs) Right. Right. Sadness is like life under empire. Sadness is the overarching, like depletion of our power our subjugation, our inability to respond and to act um, collectively or in, even individually. Do you think sorrow maybe captures that kind of definitive quality better? It does, but it, it still didn't land well. Um, and so we, mm-hmm. we so a big part of writing this book was done through relationships and interviews, um, took five right. years, and we really responded to, we tried to live the book in our relationships, right? So the book changed immensely through these conversations, primarily with, you know, uh, with women of color and indigenous women and black women who were like, don't tell me how to feel. And they're right. You know? Um, and uh, we just really heard it. Um, and that's why we came up with the term rigid radicalism as the kind of the other thing. <laughs> yeah, totally. And and for folks who haven't read the book, can you, can you talk a little bit about what that, what that term means and, and sort of, you know, how you eventually settled on it. Right. And I don't think to this day we're settled on it. So <laughs> um, sure, sure. again, the process of continually, yeah. you know, growing and evolving. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So the thing is, is that um, the conversation started, we had an institute at the Thistle uh, in 2011 and um, Nick came to it and he, I'm telling Nick's story a little bit, um, but he was just like, wow, this feels so good here. Like these people are like hospitality is huge. There's curiosity, there's experimentation, there's, there's, there's joy. Um, but there's also this intense radicalism and what is this? Right. And he come, he's, he came to the book coming from a place of like a recovering sad militant. Um, so, Mm -hmm. you know, like a, a guiding thing was Foucault's great, you know, you don't have to be sad to be a militant, even though what you're fighting is so brutal. And then a few years later, I was making a documentary about youth liberation and autonomy and stuff. And I interviewed Richard Day. Um, who, I don't know if you know his work. He wrote Gramsci is Dead. Um, <laughs> really? That's really good. That's I, re- I really recommend title. it. Yeah, it's really, really good. Yeah, <laughs> really captures, gets people's imagination going and basically saying, you know, it's about the hedge money being the problem. Um, anyway, mm-hmm. so we, um, he was interviewing me for, uh, he was doing a, I think a movie on autonomy and, and stuff. And, um, I was telling him about the thistle and he goes, wow, that sounds like joyful militancy. And I was like, what is that? (laughs) 2011. Right. I was just like, Oh, wow. That's going to be a thing. (laughs) Right. And, um, right. And when you read a lot of Latin, uh, a lot of work out of Latin America, particularly like, when you like we interviewed a few people in Argentina like about 2001 their their uprisings and stuff and it's just like you know that that notion that's there that militancy is just so like um like I'm like I'm militant about like I'm it's unwavering right like I'm I think the difference between you asked me about radicalism but I'm getting there so militancy is kind of like this un unwavering it's not rigid it's like but I'm like, no one's going to convince me that kids aren't oppressed under the system. Like I, I'm militant about that, my position on this, right? Rigid radicalism would be, and we kind of point to three different stories about it. We don't, we don't try to pit it down once, in a, once and for all, but um, would be like, um, yes, children are oppressed. 
And I have 10 ways to do it better. And we have to implement it or else you all are failures in our space. It's very like dogmatic, top down sort of. Dogmatic, uh, ideological. Um, and it comes from, through a, like a long history of moralism, um, the fear of being not good enough. And um, I should step back a little second here. And <clears throat> we had held two social spaces summit at the Purple Thistle with people from all around, mostly uh, the US who run social spaces. And these conversations were happening really quietly of like, you know, we're, we destroy each other's, we're supposedly coming together because we want to prefigure and create and talk about creating a better world or better worlds. But we're, we destroy each other in our relationships, like call out culture, all that stuff was really starting to take off. And this is like 2012, 2013. Um, and Nick and I were like, how do you write about that without replicating it? Mm-hmm. Right? Like, how do you, how do you do that? And I'm like, yeah, that's such a task. Like, I was like, we it just would be center so easy joy. to offer prescriptive yeah. stuff, yeah. you know, it would be so easy to just be like, oh yeah, you know, like here are these 10 ways, like, yeah. you, like you just said, to, to, to pull this apart. But it, it's, uh, it, I, I really appreciate the wisdom that went into the decision to be like, nah, uh, you know, if we do that, then we end up replicating the exact same thing that we want to, um, right to critique and, to, and to, to dismantle. And it's really interesting, you know, thinking about this, especially sort of from a, from an anarchistic yep. perspective, right? Because it's doing similar work, mm-hmm. right? It's looking at this sort of um, rigidity and, and it could be, it could be the state, it could be gender, it could be patriarchy, it could be any, you know, litany mm-hmm. of the various hierarchies and oppressions that, you know, liberatory politics oppose and seek to dismantle and seek to um, supplant with something um, more generative and life-giving mm-hmm. and, and joyous, <laughs> dare I say. <laughs> but like, it's really interesting that y'all, you know, made that choice uh, really actively and in, in, in conversation and in concert with not just each other, but with, you know, different communities that you were engaging with in an attempt to really dial in on this precise problem and not just talk about it or critique it, but actually emulate a solution to it in the act of right. critiquing it, which I, I think is really laudable. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. I had somebody say that it was like, we didn't, we weren't, didn't do perspectives, but there are pathways. You do provide pathways. There's like, there's lots right. of like things to chew on and think about. And, um, and like my, my biggest, I have a couple of things. My biggest thing I try to do is to disrupt the idea, the false idea that nothing's ever been done before. Or, you know, when people say no one takes care of each other, I, I just, I just <laughs> see red. <laughs> Right. Right. Um, Like, yes, I do. So we really approached it from an affirmative theory place of like pointing out and showing all the ways that we already are doing joyful militancy or militant joy or whatever, or these radical ways of being together. Um, And just centering, we got in trouble from a few academics who were like, you kind of did the book backwards. Like I, you centered joy, you made empire the problem. And then this thing like rigid radicalism is kind of like, you know, pushed to the back and one, one and a half chapters about it. And like, it should have been the center. That's what we actually care about. And I'm like, but it's the same. It's actually rigid radical. <laughs> like it, mm-hmm. it, you're, you, you're falling into the trap of like, here's right. the problem. Let's punch each other about it, about round a bit and try to outdo each <laughs> other. And here's some solutions because I have it all figured out. Instead, it was like, right. joy is the goal because we want to increase our collective power to do and be more for each other and get rid of empire. Empire is the ultimate enemy. Our subjugation is the problem. Empire for, for us means all the tentacles, right? So colonialism, capitalism, whiteness, ableism, um, ageism, trans, you know, transphobia and the list goes on um racism anti-blackness um but empire when we when we focus on just one of the tentacles empire just sits back and laughs so we got to focus on empire as as being a a part of it all um and that was just though that was a strategy to get out of the trap of maybe pointing out spaces or people who are really rigid (laughs) Right? right um because it is, it is beyond, it is, there is this thing that's happening that's outside of ourselves. And alongside, and this comes back to Ursula Le Guin and why her books and her work inspires me and creates my, um, 
or just I think planted seeds on how to think about this is like empires and I think we could probably point to Foucault too for the theory personnel there but that you know empires in this, in us too so it's in us it's in our relationships it's everywhere it's the kill the cop inside your head thing um, and I think sometimes what happens when we have these conversations is, is we put the enemy outside of ourselves and then um, and then we do this us and, us and them dichotomy and it's just not true it's not real well, it becomes, it's so easy, right? It's, it's the easy mm -hmm. way out, right? It's this ability to just say, oh, well, you know, uh, okay, okay, I don't want to fall into the, the trap, so I'm going to speak in. It's hard. I do it all. I'm going to try and model this thing. It is really hard to do, though. Um, you know, it would be really easy to say, um, oh, I got to think about how to do this without, without <laughs> being a rigid radical. You know what? Mm. You get to, the, I mean, podcasts are hard because we're doing this public conversation, but the big thing we talked about in our book is that you have to have a, you have to have your intimates and your people you vent with, and that you do play out these ways that were socialized, and and because um, we are subjugated, we are frustrated, we are pissed off, we are pissed off at the buddy, at the thing who mansplains all the time, and we do want to punch at right. him, you know. <laughs> we don't always, we always don't want to punch up, and the only way I can show up well with my community and not punch at them is that I have those intimate people, those close people, that kin who I can vent with freely. You have to. You 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 are like some kind of special Taoist goddess if you can't, if you don't have to do that. <laughs> I don't know. So I just want to say like, <laughs> don't be too hard on yourself. Like that reaction is is real. That's we're frustrated, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that. <laughs> but I think it there is um, you know, there is wisdom uh well, that, that, I think that that's true. And I think that you're absolutely right. Like, you know, having those kinds of deep and meaningful kind of kinship relations and being able to vent with people is really useful. I still think that the practice of trying to break that yeah. habit is still a worthwhile thing to, to, to engage in. Um, so I want to try anyway. <laughs> so, so that being said, it's interesting thinking about, right, how you could begin to walk down this path of saying that a certain um, political tendency or a certain um, kind of political fixation might end up missing the forest for the trees, mm -hmm. right? Like might end up, as you, to use your illustration, might focus on a tentacle rather than on mm -hmm. the hydra mm -hmm. itself, right? Um, and I think that uh, what joyful militancy or, or militant joy, to use the term <laughs> you and I prefer, I think what it gets right is this constant reminder of of what it is that we're actually fighting for <laughs> right not getting not getting lost in this mythical quest to find right the idealized revolutionary subject or or what have you but is instead always focused on that horizon mm -hmm. right um you know to to quote uh to quote our fave <laughs> right right f focused on the journey rather than on um, the destination, mm -hmm. um, that the true journey is return, mm -hmm. um, and this sort of revolutionary cyclical process, like revolution in, in like the actual, like a circle, like an, a, right. a, like a full revolution, um, and a, and like a sort of time and, and, and cosmic scale. And I think that that, you know, approach to focusing on that eternally receding horizon mm -hmm. that we'll never quite get to, but we can always continue taking steps towards mm -hmm. is a huge part of this, this idea of, of, of constantly not only seeking joy, but prefiguring it in our, in our relationships. Mm -hmm. So as to ensure that it never becomes, um, just a focus on militancy or on, you know, something like revolutionary violence in order to like achieve some kind of greater good, but is instead always, um, insisting continuously, right. That the ends don't justify the means, but the ends in many ways are the right. Means, and that, that we're constantly trying to move towards greater and greater, um, you know, abundances of joy rather than venerating some mythical, like, um, uh, you know, revolutionary subject or, um, 
you know, fetishizing the concept of, of work, right? right? Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, instead trying to like really focus on what is it that we want and then making it happen mm -hmm. rather than, you know, making sacrifices of saying, well, in order to get to this point, we're going to have to do X, Y, and Z. We need to, mm -hmm. you know, first uh, accomplish these goals and then maybe we'll get there is instead saying, no, fuck that. We're just going to, we're just going to, you know, take the whole thing right yeah. now. I love that. Yeah. It's bang on. Yeah. I just want to quickly say that my friend Kitty Sipples, they talk a lot about the tentacles and the Hydra. So I just wanted to give a shout out to them. <laughs> Hell yeah. Shout out to them. Absolutely. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to ask you, because um, we've kind of been circling around the subject for for quite a, quite some time. And so I kind of want to just cut heart, cut to the heart of it. Is The Dispossessed your favorite <laughs> book <laughs> or, or not? 100% <laughs> is. 100% <laughs> is. I, I think I did a, um, a post where I, I put together an Instagram. Um, I actually showed it to somebody on Instagram the other day because of a debate about, about Ursula <laughs> and The Dispossessed. Um, Do you mind if I ask what the debate was? Oh, just that the book's more about rigid radicalism versus joyful militancy. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, um, I had went and looked up a bunch of quotes specifically from the book and I was like, holy moly, did this book ever plant seeds in all different directions? Like not just the joy mm -hmm. piece, but I can't remember them all right now, but I can send it to you later. I, I was just like, yeah. Um, and I've reread it. And I, I know I, a lot of people in that post I did on Twitter way past they passed me like I think some people said like 12 times or something <laughs> <laughs> um I think I read it for I, I I have it by my bed and I look at it a lot um I like bounce my copy is literally sitting right here yeah <laughs> I'm looking at but it I, as we I speak. also like I really the thing that um and I don't really because I don't it's not a dogma thing or anything like that but like her the Taoism that runs through all her mm -hmm. work most of her work is also what's really important. Um, so her rendition of the Tao is probably one of my most favorite books of all time. I've heard it's really good. I've never actually sat down. I've 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 read it. Um, I've just not read her version. Um, oh, and, and I'm I'm curious. <laughs> the is, best. It, is it a direct translation? No, it's a rendition. Okay, she's really gotcha. clear about that. So she grew up with her dad, who was a Taoist, and he also translated. So it's been in her life her whole time her mm -hmm. whole life um but i really i actually you can buy the cd of her reading it oh fuck yeah that's awesome dowing the way you can go isn't the real way the name you can say isn't the real name heaven and earth begin in the unnamed. Name is the mother of the ten thousand things. So the unwanting soul sees what's hidden, and the ever-wanting soul sees only what it wants. Two things, one origin, but different in name, whose identity is mystery. Mystery of all mysteries. The door to the hidden. But you got to get the book because her notes <laughs> are probably the best part. Um, mm -hmm. Because she's, you know, her politics are really clear. Like she's just anti-capitalist, like, you know, and just hits it. Um, and two people who read the book said, hey, you wrote a Taoist book like Ursula. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> now, Nick would be like more along the lines of Par Parable of the Soul or like, you know, Octavia Butler's, you know, everything you touch, you change, everything you change, changes you. That's more what Nick would say the book is about. And if there's like an underpinning like theory or uh, philosophy that's godlike or, you know, Taoist or something, he would say his, his comes from Octavia Butler it does but i'm like no it's very taoist approach <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I definitely see that synthesis for sure. Yeah. Um, I had I I could see the dispossessed all throughout it. Yeah. Um, and in fact, the question I'm about to ask you is is directly related to that. But I think. I could definitely see that argument as well that it's like deeply informed by Parable of the Sower, mm -hmm. which this is a conversation for another time. Not my favorite, actually, not my favorite sci fi book. I really appreciate Octavia Butler, but there are some things about that particular text. But that's, oh that's my gosh, for I mean, yeah, we'll have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I did want to, I did want to talk with you because, you know, one of the things that has occurred to me just as we've been having this conversation is kind of how joyful militancy really parallels <laughs> the dispossessed in some interesting ways. Um, and I'm sure this is what your argument with, with your friend and comrade was about. But like, what's interesting to me, right, is that people are going to look at the dispossessed in one of two ways. And, and you know, for folks who are just listening to this podcast for the first time and don't know, we've done a uh, <laughs> series on uh, the dispossessed. And it's funny because the argument that I'm about to play out is exactly the argument that we had on that <laughs> podcast. And I come down on one side, but that's, you yeah. know, whatever. Uh, not to beat a dead horse. <laughs> the The point is, the book really does focus on this um, rejection of the dogmatism that I think could become uh, implicit in an anarchic society. Yeah. Um, and and that, that, that rigid, we, we could call it rigid radicalism, we could call it dogmatism, we could call it many things, right? Um, but this sort of... Um, this this hoarding of social capital mm -hmm. as a way of um, insulating oneself from critique um, and creating a new form of, of hierarchy, mm -hmm. um, which is something that uh, I have unfortunately experienced myself in certain circles where, uh, you know, seasoned um, uh, radicals will instead of approaching every situation from a place of humility and understanding and collaboration instead say, well, this is how we did it back then. And this is how we're going to do it again. Right. And <laughs> oh my like, gosh, it's like, no, we live in different, we live in a different world and there are different conditions. And like the, the like the, the, the goalposts have shifted and, you know, anyways, remember I said two things I hate more than anything. One is like, that's never been done. That's the second one. It's all oh, no. <laughs> so you just hit the nail on the head. I'm like, Oh, <laughs> Well, I, I I I can't say that I'm glad that I gave you uh, <laughs> you know reason to, to be disgusted, but uh, it is it is I think an important thing to discuss. I, I, I but I digress. I guess the point I'm trying to make is you could look at the dispossessed as you know this is what happens to all radicals mm -hmm. is they stagnate and they become dogmatic and you know they become rigid and fixed. And no, what she's saying is that it's a it's a yes. cycle, and that there has to be somebody who comes in and breaks that cycle and continues to break it, and that we have to be constantly, constantly aware of the fact that hierarchy can and oftentimes will creep into our social dynamics, mm -hmm. and that if we aren't ever vigilant against it, then what ends up happening is we replicate these patterns that humankind has fallen mm -hmm. into time and time and time and time and time and time again. And and if we approach the book looking at it from Shevik's perspective, not as some, you know, messianic figure a la Odo or, or what have you, who is simply just another individual who is breaking that cycle. Mm -hmm. If we if we look at Shevik as a flawed um, individual part of a larger community, right? It wasn't an individual effort that led Shevik to challenge the the social capital of um, Anaris. It, it was his affinity with his friends, with his partner, um, with his children, right? Yeah. And trying to work together to bring bring down that um, system. Yeah. And and that's what I think is so why it's such a powerful book and why I think that um, it's it's maybe not the first uh, – I know this is something that my friend Margaret Krilljoy has said before, or rather I, I should say probably our mutual yeah. <laughs> friend because um, I know I know she's been on your podcast yeah. as well. Um, our mutual friend Margaret Kiljoy has said in the past that it's usually not the first anarchist book she refers yeah. to people because like it does take like it does really take like some serious consideration and and you could be forgiven if you approached the book through the lens of thinking well you know that even even an anarchist society is eventually mm -hmm. gonna like succumb to hierarchy and that's not the no. point that she's trying mm -hmm. to make right her, her point is is that we have to be constantly vigilant against it we have to constantly critique it and we have to dismantle it whenever it um, rears yeah. its ugly head. And I think that in many ways that, that your and, and Nick's book does the exact same mm -hmm. thing where it looks at 
this sort of dogmatic approach to um, revolutionary organizing, community organizing, um, direct action, whatever you want to call it, and instead says, no, we, we're, we're, we're missing the forest yeah. for the trees here, yeah. and we need to instead begin to really engage meaningfully with what it means to um, like focus on – uh, what the end goal is, and for both for Shevik and um and and joyful militancy, that 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 end goal is joy. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. It's the best compliment ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I posted. There's some uh, a stranger. I hope I always say a stranger, and then it ends up being somebody I know. But anyways, they posted it when the book first came out. They did, posted a picture of the dispossessed with joyful militancy, and it like I was like, I've made it. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. I did. And that's thing. what people react to it. They're like, really? They go together? How? <laughs> and so I that's really, so really appreciate that. Um, Cause I, when I read those books, like I, I'm, I'm pretty, and this is why I was talking earlier about my neural different. Like I, this is why school is hard for me um, is I get kind of lost in the story. Like I get lost in the relationships um, and I don't mm-hmm. always take all those notes <laughs> and like, and uh, so then I start doubting myself. I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe, right? Maybe it isn't joyful, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, maybe that was just my my takeaway of of these people. But so I really appreciate right. um, the affirmation back at me saying <laughs> you're affirming my yeah. uh, take on it. Well, of course. I mean, it's it's like I said, it's one I share, and it, I think you know, for whatever it's worth, I think folks could be forgiven for thinking that it's like, it's a really sad book. It like it is yeah. in many ways, it is a tragedy. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and while, you know, while Shevik is, I like to think ultimately successful, we don't really know what happens once he like returns to Anaris. Oh. And so like, it's imp- entirely possible that his former comrades could martyr him, I you know. know, as soon as he steps off the ship, like they tried to at the beginning of yeah. the book. Um, but I like to think, right, especially, you know, especially in conversation with her other work and, and how cru- crucial the Ansible is to, like, the rest of the Hainish cycle. Yeah. I like to think that he was ultimately successful, um, and I think that that's kind of implicit. Totally. Um, but just because he was successful doesn't mean he wasn't martyred. Yeah, you know? right. Um, and so, you know, I think that, like, yeah, I, I mean, I think that people could be forgiven for thinking that it is a, a bleak and sad and harrowing text because it really yeah. is that in, in so many ways. Um but I also think that it's one that, um, the in spite of all of that tragedy, it chooses joy defiantly. Yeah, yeah, yay! <laughs> and relationships, right? Because this is what, oh, like, sure. all the work I try to do is to uh, amplify and show that we have to just show up with trust and responsibility for each other, and that's like that's the key to autonomy with youth: um, listening, trust, and autonomy. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, you know, like my 16 year old said to me the other day, his, like, his partner was like, he doesn't, his partner doesn't have a good home life. I can talk about this publicly because we do a podcast called Ground of Futures together. The three, the four, there's another um, adult who does it with us. So the, the two teens do it with me and they um, mm-hmm. have very different lives. So Joey is a trans mass kid who is um, very oppressive home, uh, goes to an all girls public school, private school. Um, and sometimes he gets confused about Liam's decisions around like canceling because he's made a commitment to do something with us, like watch Mandalorian, like nothing, nothing huge. <laughs> it's a pandemic. <laughs> and Liam said to me, you know, I, ha- I have to constantly remind him that, yeah, I do have freedom and autonomy, but with that comes responsibility. And it's like a kind of responsibility right. that I'm into, like, cause, cause I actually like my parents. Like we, I have a relationship with them. It goes both ways. Like, you know, I, I'm responsible for my commitments and I have to show up in a way. um, You know, it's not like, it's not, it's not extractive, right? It's not, there's a reciprocity that's flowing with that, with the autonomy. And I was just like, wow, cool. Like, you know, cause I don't beat them over the head with like, this is what I think. I just try to do it. Um, So it's just something that he picked up through. Yeah. Or or just around how we react with each other. But um, it was interesting because I think, it made me think about like it's so it's so tiny. It seems so simple, right? Like right. we'd be, you know, people are always like, you know, you're not being responsible because you know your kids up till four in the morning every night right now and sleeps till two. And I'm like, I think I'm being responsive to his mental <laughs> health. It's a pandemic. 
<laughs> and he's trans and he can't get his, you know, because of all the lockdowns, he can't pursue some of the things that are necessary for that trans stuff to be better for him. Right. Um, I'm thinking I'm being responsive. And I think people, you know, so just, I think you, if you just like bring it right down to your most intimate relationships and um, try to remove my new obsession is like getting rid of extraction um, from our social relationships it will the outgrowth to like systems and society is is really possible more possible right because we're we're mm-hmm. living it in the everyday we're not being extractive with each other and I wanted to swing back to something you said about the social thing I, I'm really concerned with the trend of the intersection between the rise of identity politics which I think's like thank god we're we're messing it up and decentering whiteness necessary and where there's a there's a penchant towards ignoring uh, personal power. Um, personal power, anybody can have that. In like social power, I mean, not personal power, social power. Anyone on any axis of oppression in a group can have social power, and to to just not talk about it and to ignore it because of um, like say if I was on a collective with a bunch of men. Um, cis men and it was you know me and I um, and there was no other they were all white (laughs) I'm trying to keep the like the identity to just that Mm -hmm. that dynamic Um, but you know the collective was built on my ideas a bit they all read the book Um, I'm really compelling I have all this social power to to not talk about that and to just be like I'm dealing with patriarchy all the time I'm the oppressed one in the room is kind of where I think we get ourselves really mucked up and in trouble um, with the potential to really move towards um, dismantling um, this this empire. Sorry, that was very yeah. <laughs> messy, but it is no, messy. No, no. The whole point I mean, is it, messy. Listen, life is messy. And yeah. It's called, yeah, called uh, willpower. And I worked with kids always, and this is why I'm able to talk about this. This is the conversation we had all the time. Some kids have so much social power. Oh my God. And we would talk about it, right? And we like, doesn't negate the systemic and the institutional power that's at play and shitty on that kid. But the social power that that kid has needs to be talked about. I just think we don't talk about power enough. And I think that Ursula Le Guin was always interested in talking about power. 100%. And and I think it, it's, it's a... Uh... You know, it, it, it's difficult um, to always disentangle the times when power becomes domination, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because, like, you know, having social power can be a really positive, yes, like, good thing. Goal. It can be a really emancipatory <laughs> yeah, thing, yeah. right? Like, you know, when we share that power with each other, when we, when we build each other up, when we share knowledge and create new mm-hmm. knowledge together by synthesizing what each of us as individuals know and create it into something new, right? But, like... I think it is really important to continually um, be on guard against um, nascent forms of domination wherever they might arise because invariably like they crop up um, and, yeah. and, um, and, 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 and often in places that you wouldn't expect yeah. um, like an anarchist fucking commune. <laughs> um, but, but you know, that shit happens. And uh, that's putting ideas over people, right? right. Like I, that's one of my thing of like, you know, relation, friendship over projects, friendships over ideas, friendships over the, the cause. Like if you, if we just could flip it, we'd just have a better life. Um, For sure. We just would. And it's hard though. I I can't always do it because capitalism, I got to put my project ahead of sometimes of being there for a friend because I got, I said I would do the thing. I'm not talking about the practical ways. I'm talking about like in the deep, profound way where we make decisions, where we throw people away because they don't fit into our ideology anymore. And um, yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. And you know, I'm often, uh, I'm often troubled by um, conversations that I have, especially with like, um, like new comrades, um, who are like, I'm going to be devoted to this thing, you know, 110% or like, I'm never going to talk to a conservative again. (laughs) And I'm just like, brother, like, 
you know, maybe, maybe slow your roll just a little <laughs> bit there, pal. Uh, cause like, while I appreciate the, 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 the militancy you got there, I think you're missing the other crucial ingredient. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't always put it in that particular way, but like, I think that is kind of, you know, what ends up happening is, is, um, people get turned on to this sort of work and, um, and I, I think it is really powerful and life affirming work, right? Like that's like why we keep doing totally. it. <laughs> um, and it, you know, it, we actually do, uh, I think, um, I can't remember who said it, but like, I don't think we should ever be fooled into thinking that a small group of friends can't change right. the world. Margaret um, Mead. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> But at the same time, I also think that it is folly to throw oneself into, uh, you know, revolutionary organizing mm -hmm. or community organizing or quote, like activism, mm -hmm. right? You know, without anything else, because like then you're, you're a, you're going to burn yourself out. B, you're not going to be able to fully develop into a human <laughs> being and C, what the fuck is the point of having a social and political and economic revolution if not to be able to self-actualize oh, and become yeah. your your own fully authentic, you know, individual human totally. being, right? Like that's the whole point yeah, of yeah, this yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, so I don't know. It's just uh, it's just a timely, I think, discussion, especially as people are getting, um, you know, really activated by mm -hmm. um, the uprisings that happened this summer, yeah. um, by the crises of um, capitalism and the pandemic and the ways that those things are insinu insinuating um, within one, one another, and especially with climate mm -hmm. change. You know, there are a lot of folks that are uh, new to this work. And, and uh, you know, I think one of um, my greatest regrets now as like, or, or greatest regrets now as someone who has like um, done this for a while would be to see new folks burn mm -hmm. out because they didn't have that synthesis mm -hmm. of both the the self and the community mm -hmm. simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So anyways, that's, that's a, that's a whole, that's a whole nother. Can of yeah. I mean, it's all being, it's been getting laid bare in a way that it wasn't before. Right. And people are really seeing, um, but you're also seeing a rise in liberalism like never before. And I, today, like I, <laughs> what did you say like imagine if more of us didn't lobby the state like we could get so much done like right. like i get why some people have to lobby the state like i get it um we got to end suffering right now for a bunch of people we got to get rid of student debt we got to get rid of hospital debt like particularly in the u.s right um here it's housing and um other issues of poverty and whatnot um but yeah i, I just wish more people would really trust turn to each other um and 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 I, that's why i like autonomy over anarchy because um because autonomy is literally about our relationship to power and with power mm -hmm. and figuring out how, because it it um gets you away from the dichotomy of individualism and the collective um so I don't know, but it's another word. It's another, uh, it's another thing to pin down. It's another thing to put a bunch of tenants to an ideology. And then we can get all rigid about, you know, you're more autonomous than right. me. And, um, <laughs> you know, like, uh, autonomous, yeah. like, uh, I had Marina search in on silver threads and she was saying that, but horizontalism, like, it's not something you are, you have, like, it's something you do. And same with autonomy and same with anarchy. Right. Um, that was Graeber's thing, right? Like, I'm not an anarchist. It's something I do. Like, that anarchism is something I do, <laughs> right? Um, right? Poor one out for a real one. Uh, the world really, <sighs> really suffered a blow last year. It suffered a lot of blows last year. Oh, when he does that one hit particularly close to home. I literally was like a like a wreck uh -huh. for a week. Yeah. It was awful. Really, really sad. Um, yeah, yeah, just really, 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 really yeah, sad. Super tragic. Well, before we kind of wrap this up, yeah, I, I just wanted to, to pick your brain just about one last <laughs> thing, and, and you've already kind of touched on it a little bit, but tell us about Silver Threads and Grounded Futures. For folks that are are, are um, new to your work or, or haven't heard about your podcasts, um, what are they? And, and I, I also want to say that, um, especially by the time this com comes out, I'm pleased to say that Silver Threads is now a member of the oh, Channel Zero Network, are. which is really <laughs> awesome. Yay. Yep. Um, so if I'm the first person to tell you that, <laughs> you like, you, you know, that's, that's that. 
I mean, Tim was like the one who, you know, shepherded along, but I, he hadn't followed up. <laughs> yeah. He followed up in the CZN. So now, you okay, know, um, <laughs> I'll let him know. I, now I feel bad. I thought Tim was going to tell you yesterday because he and I corresponded about it, but maybe it slipped his mind or whatever. Uh, regardless. Okay. Um, I was like, yeah. if there's a but, touch so, <laughs> <laughs> so so what what are for folks who haven't listened to them what are silver threads and grounded futures okay i'll try to be as succinct as possible because they're very they're connected but they're very distinctly different um so at the core of it is storytelling um my work as an artist a curator media maker has always been about amplifying voices that are less heard but also inviting in people who are well-known so that there's like this beautiful like so that they actually get amplified quite frankly so we're using some social capital to amplify other people. Um, and it's like a, just a nice mutual aid thing. So that's kind of the at the base of it. Um, Grounded Futures um, is a platform that I do with Jamie Lee Gonzalez and um, Melissa Roach. And the idea is to take that and, and support community members to um, share, do that, make their own media, whatever that multimedia is, right? But right now we're just doing podcasts because of the pandemic. Um, you know, provide our skills and our training and have some kind of reciprocity happening. So that's part of it. And then we do our own work. The show came out of my kid, my 16 year old, um, who was 15 at the time, um, with all the like, um, cap, uh, climate change stuff happening for young people, um, was really frustrated with the conversation around young people it was really like, this is limiting to say that we only can strike from school. First of all, I don't go to school. So I'm irritated there. Um, second of all, right. I want to, and this, you know, this isn't going to surprise you that my kid would say this, but I want to get together with people and have a conversation of what would happen if we can't stop capitalism and we can't actually stop climate change. What are we doing about it? How are we looking after each other? What are we building in our neighborhoods? I want to have those workshops in that conversation. Um, so Nick, I immediately, Nick, do that conversation. <laughs> Um, and we, we worked with Liam, that's my son. And we, we came up with a couple of workshop ideas and then the pandemic hit. So I just, we just brought it together. We did, let's do the podcast, call it, call it grounded futures. And so Liam and I, and Jamie Lee and Joey, his partner, um, host people. I think we should have you on. You'd be really great. We just had Margaret Kildray on and, yeah, I listened to that one. Yeah, so you got you get a sense of like they they have the questions. They came up with those questions. Um, it's very um, consent based, and um, uh, when we if me and Jamie are talking a lot, it's because we've been asked to. They're having a hard day, whatever. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing now. We will uh, once the pandemic ends do those workshops. We did put it out to the community. It would be really intergenerational, and people were really stoked because. I think a lot of people are scared to have that conversation. It's, it sounds so like hopeless, and negative, but it's like so real. <laughs> it's like it's yeah. the pre free, it's the what Scott Crow calls dual power, right? Like this is the, mm -hmm. I know he, it's picked up from earlier ideas of dual power, but I like his take on it. Um, so that, you know, doing both. Um, sorry. So that's, that's that show. And then Silver Threads is a, an extension of joyful militancy. Um, I was like, ah, oh, let's amplify. So yeah, a lot of people are joining, are, are getting energized because of late capitalism, because of uh, climate change. This is before the pandemic. Because um, things are going to shit, fires are happening everywhere. And I think a lot of people who are just kind of joining organizing or radicalism or whatever are arriving and thinking that all oh, people who have been here have it all figured out. They've, they've always known what they know. I'm so, I'm so lacking. So I was like, I've heard that a million yeah. times from, from, from newcomers. Yeah. So I was like, how about if I, we do, we do a video show and if, and I reached out to Eleanor Goldfield, um, who's amazing and said, why don't we do a video show where we go around and we interview long-term organizers, long-term radicals about, I don't know, they're like their watershed moments, but also the ways they failed, the hard parts, the just to show that we're always walking. And so the subline is still walking, still waking um, to show that we're like, yeah, that we are having a hard time. So whatever pandemic happened a month later. So we didn't do that. 
Um, but in the summer, as the uprisings started happening and thing, and Eleanor is very frontline, she's in Washington, D.C. She was super involved as an organizer, even amid the um, uh, pandemic through mutual aid and um, um, solidarity with BIPOC folks and whatnot. And she was noticing the uptick of this, of that worry, that concern of new people are like, ah, I don't have it figured out. So uh, we literally text each other the same day and said, we need to do it now. We need to do a podcast. Um, so that's what the, the idea is. And I, I, we're getting feedback that for people who have read Joyful Militancy are saying that, yep, they see the continuation, they see the thread. Um, and then, and the feedback from like, uh, Klee Benelli was saying, like, we need to share our mistakes more. Like, we're just, we just, we just don't do it because there's not a yeah. platform for it. Um, and it's, you know, I, I, and just hearing people, right. And this is probably why maybe I should ask why you do your podcast. Cause I think just hearing stories is what actually moves us and hearing, hearing that we struggle and we're always moving and changing and, and it's vulnerable and it's hard and, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'd rather just watch Breaking yeah. Bad, quite frankly, some days, but let's just... <laughs> My partner and I have been watching Breaking Bad. I've been, uh, I've been, it's like introducing her to it and we have to kind of take it in like uh, stuttering steps. You got to watch it through the lens of Jesse. The story's about Jesse's growth. Oh yeah. If you watch it 100%. through there, it's all good. If you don't watch it through that lens, it's a terrible, terrible show. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Could not see you and I have the exact same sort of like literary analysis, uh, which I'm very here for. Um, I was going to say something. Oh, uh, you should uh, you should definitely link up with Amy and Liz from Rebel Steps okay. if you haven't already, because they are doing very similar okay. work um, with their podcast at Silver Threads. Um, so that would be a good good yeah, connection. Yeah. I can't can't you know uh, lift them up uh, enough. They're they're doing 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 cool. excellent work. So yeah, yeah, and there's a myth of scarcity, right? Some people would immediately go, "Oh no, it's already been done." And me, I'm like, "No, no, no, no." We need to amplify stories all the time. And people talking yeah. with me and Eleanor are gonna, we're gonna bring out different parts of them than Rebel Steps will, right? And right. it's just, yeah, oh, it's gonna no, be different. We sure. could have the same people on it. It's gonna be different. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. And I think that um, that that adage of like you know, we obviously, we learn more from our failures, right? We need to fail more, fail often, fail better. Yeah. Um, it's something I said on this podcast. I probably love it. Yeah. Too many times. <laughs> um, but yeah, I know. Uh, I think that that's, that's huge. Um, so that's awesome. You asked me a question. I can't remember though. I asked you why you do your podcast. <laughs> oh yeah. Honestly, it's just so fucking cool to have conversations like right. this, you know? Um, and like, you know, it's so weird. Um, because there are people that I have um, really admired and whose work I've really enjoyed and um, has spoke to me, um, who I've gotten to have co cool conversations with and who I now call like friends yeah. and comrades. And like, you know, that's like something that I uh, approach like really from a place, I hope, I, I hope from a place of humility, like just because I'm like overwhelmed by how fucking cool it is. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, like it's just so neat to have conversations with people um and simulate that kind of uh intimacy that you would have like having coffee with a friend and i don't think the podcast is always like that you know i think this episode has been um but those are definitely the mm -hmm. best episodes the ones that are less interviewee and the ones that get off the rails <laughs> um and i think <laughs> you know i think it's easiest uh with some of my um comrades who i probably have like we we have closer ideological yeah. kind of positions um those conversations kind of are feel a little bit more organic um and i you know i i'm open to like having like larger conversations with everyone because i want to learn from mm -hmm. everyone so like you know those conversations that i have with people who i disagree with are also really fruitful and, mm -hmm. and beneficial because they um i think as long as we come from a place of like comradely like respect being able to like synthesize and um hear from different people's experiences whether they're you know musicians or artists or community organizers or um w academics or authors what have yeah. you um getting that variety of different perspectives has been like really nourishing for me and so at this point it's really just like an excuse i guess the the, the reader's digest version is it's an excuse to have cool conversations with people that i wouldn't be able to have otherwise yeah. you know yeah. Yeah, it really comes through your show. And so it's like, hey, come on this podcast and yeah. talk with me. And no, you're really <laughs> like, good at it. You know, I would never be able to do that without, you know, 
having a podcast. Right. <laughs> and so now it's like an excuse to, to be like, hey, you're cool. Come over here. Let's have a, have a, have a cool conversation. Yeah. And we'll record it just so that other people can listen. But really, this is for me. Let's be honest. Yeah. No, I mean, you, so. you really emulate it. You really emulate the – like I – we – we had coffee shops like this on the, you know, where I live, like people would show up and there there, there were radical coffee shops and people would sit around and you got to know some people and the conversations were, this, I'm talking back in, like in the nineties, like this is, you're emulating it. It's beautiful. And that's why I like, I told you, I'm so jealous of the name. So, <laughs> it's so good. And I, well, I really appreciate I think, that. Like, I just wanted to really kind of go on the record because it's partly why I think what you're doing and I think what I'm trying to do too, what we're trying to do with Silver Threads and it was something Marina Citrin reminded me of because I think as anarchists or anarchy or uh, anti-authoritarians, we sometimes um, we get, we talk a lot about like keeping it local and working with our community and relationships, which I did a lot in this conversation, but it's really, really important to um, scale over and have those relationships these conduits that like reach other places and it's something I really really tend to and work on is my relationships at a distance so like I text all the time all the time hell yeah yeah I'll shoot you I'll dm you my my number and we can signal I'm I love it hell yeah well listen if that's an if that's an open uh if that's an open um offer listen I I will be remiss if I don't take you up on it because God knows I've had questions, um, especially being thrust into this, not, a, not, not like being thrilled by, um, getting to, to help parent, um, but also not expecting it. Yeah. Um, that's lovely. And, and like not being prepared yeah. for it. So like, <laughs> it's been, um, I think I, I like to think that I'm doing pretty good. Sounds like but, it. But like, I want to, I, I want to continue to do better. Yeah. You know, like I, like I never want to be like, yeah, satisfied. Yeah. We're always learning, right? We're always, always, always learning. 100%, 100%. Most of the things I do is because of I've learned from my kids. And I don't, it, I know people say that, but it's fucking real in my life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> for sure. I, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, sometimes people will say things as, uh, you know, banal platitudes, mm-hmm. and sometimes people say them with all sincerity. And I think regardless of whether they say them as banal platitudes or uh, with all sincerity, I think that one is absolutely true <laughs> is that we learn yeah. most from, yeah. you know, those kinds of like deep interpersonal relationships that, that you have, um, mm. you know, with, with kin. Mm-hmm. Um, so awesome. Well, um, listen, last thing before we part ways, can you just tell folks where they can find joyful militancy and where they can check out grounded futures and silver threads? Um, so joyful militancy is AK from, I think, they have um, a PDF version that's pretty cheap and it's just coming out in France. Uh, I think it's been translated for Canadian French too. And, um, but it comes out of, uh, out of France militant joy. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I just want to give them cause it just came out. And so I'm real excited for them and the translator um, groundedfutures.com has both shows. Silver Threads and Granite Futures. And then, you know, kind of goes, and then I'm at Joyful Carla on Instagram and Twitter. I am not on Facebook. Rock on. Yeah, fuck Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> hang out with Zoomers. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to convince everyone I know to get I off, know, get off it's Facebook. hard though. Um, yeah, oh, so thank man. you. And that about does it for this week's episode of Coffee with Comrades. This is an entirely DIY show run by workers for workers. If you like what you hear, you can follow us on Twitter at CoffeeWComrades and Instagram at CoffeeWithComrades. Check out our website, www.CoffeeWithComrades.com, and sign up to support our work with a monthly contribution by going to www.Patreon.com forward slash CoffeeWithComrades. You can find Coffee with Comrades on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you go to get your anti-capitalist propaganda. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. While you're there smashing that subscribe button, be sure to rate and review the show as well to help us increase our reach. If you have feedback, criticism, or you'd just like to get in touch with us, shoot us an email at coffeewithcomrades at gmail.com. Until next time, stay wild out there, comrades. Make me a bear. Make me do lie down with a smile. Everything that rides after work.
yesterday Everything changes Joy will find a way Joy will find a way As morning becomes light, as night turns to 